Hello, it's me, it's Recky. Welcome back to another severe weather reaction. This video has been suggested so many times, and I have postponed it a number of times, and the only reason why is because it's an hour long. But I'm gonna do this, and we're gonna do it now. You and me. And this is an, e, uh, an EF5 or an F5 tornado, and it's called the Jorel, Texas Tornado Dead Man Walking Documentary. It's from the channel Antarctic Vortex. Uh, and um, if you want to check it out, the video we're going to watch, and of course the channel, you find all the links available in the description and uh, go get go there and uh, give them the support and cred that they so much deserve. Of course, before we watch it, we say um, thank you to the channel members and the patrons. Thank you so much for the amazing support. Uh, a shout out to the Supreme Tier donators over by Patreon and of course on YouTube membership. Ultimate supporters gets a shout out personal. That's Deja, Walt, Tammy, Roni, and Dwayne. If you want to become one of them, click join to become a member or check out the awesome cool link in the comment section. It's pinned on top. And I have a new merchandise store. It's there too. Same link. Now, let's do this. An hour long. If you do enjoy this, don't forget to smack the like and of course hit that subscribe. And if you haven't already, get some get some beverages. Maybe get a snack or something because we're doing the long run here. And I want you aboard. They can lift buildings from their foundations and smash them to rubble in seconds. This is the loudest I can get. I just want to point that out. This is the loudest I can have the uh, video and it's 480p, so it's not a new one. So, heads up on that one. So, it's a reenactment, I think. It's not a reenactment, it's a reenactment. They can strip a landscape bare of all living things. Get caught in their path, and they can kill you. Yeah, so we, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a couple of uh, uh, reenactment and uh, stuff like that. So we're going to find out. And it's a documentary. And uh, hopefully they go in, uh, in, in depth of how, when, why. And especially, I hope to see some footage because it's called The Dead Man Walking. So we're going to find out what this is. Yeah, he's... Be careful, you're almost there. Okay, you come across right now at the intersection of Alcock and Price Road. Alcock and Price Road is going to be a little bit. Uh, does it say when it's from? Help me out. When was this in Jarrell, Texas? Let me know in the comment section. North, going into the city at this time. Just like it's not. January 1999 Arkansas but the infamous Tornado Alley in the United States has one of the highest strike rates in the world. With over 800 tornadoes a year in a strip of land spanning Texas to Nebraska, this is true. 800. The tornado capital of the world.
These huge rotating columns of air are capable of wind speeds of over 300 miles per hour. The airborne debris becomes a deadly shower of shrapnel, shredding everything in its path. Oh my lord, that's his really close. <clears throat> Now this is 99, 1999. Tornado power is measured on the Frigita scale, from the smallest F0 to the largest F5. Each step up the scale increases the power by 10 times. Again, uh, it's just the highest I can have the volume. I'm gonna try to speak a bit more, you know, at a lower volume, so you can actually crank it all up, so you can actually hear everything. So crank it up if you want to hear what they're talking about, and I will talk a bit, you know, less loud. An F1 will take the branch off a tree. An F2 will take the tree. But it is the F5 with wind speeds of up to 320 miles per hour, which is most feared. Anyone sucked into its swirling vortex has little chance of survival. On the 27th of May, 1997, an F-5 hit the small town of Gerald, near Austin, Texas. This is a recreation of what happened. So it's not Jarrell, it's Gerald. ...to some of its residents that day. Well, we got some 1999 reactments. The community of Double Creek lies on the outskirts of Gerald. A typical Texas residential suburb of simple wood frame buildings. They were not designed to withstand a serious tornado. It is the first gotta love the music. vacation, and most of the children in Double Creek are out enjoying themselves in the warm, humid Stay weather. The main road. It's busy out here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Double Creek has been home to Billy LaFrance and his family for over eight years. He works nights and has just finished his shift. Mm. Billy and his wife Debbie have been married for 20 years and have four children, but only their youngest daughter, 10 year old Kristen, is at home today. Dad, Billy catches up on the news from his wife, has something to eat, and goes to bed. Bye, Dad. On the other side of the road live Maria Hernandez and her husband Gabriel with their three children. In 1989, a tornado hit Gerald and destroyed their house. Gabriel rebuilt it, but this time he added an extra feature. It had taken him two years, but now there was a storm shelter built into the bedrock. The Hernandez family were to be thankful for Gabriel's painstaking efforts in the hours that followed. Oh, so he got completely totaled and uh, they actually, he actually built a storm shelter. What's a good call? Just over a mile away live the Bukowski family. Tammy, Keith, and their children, Blake, 15, and Amy, 14. Both Tammy and Keith are at work, so the kids are at home by themselves. I believe that. That is so weird. That is, ugh. I know. I know. Man, I miss the 90s. Neither parent no. is expected home before evening. Really? I don't like it. No. <clears throat> oh my gosh. And then, and then All three families are unaware that the weather is about to change. And I love 90s reenactments. 20 miles north of Gerald, Assistant District Attorney Lon Curtis is on his way to work. Lon. Lon is one of a network of storm spotters who tell the Meteorological Service what the weather is doing on the ground. But it gotta be a complete change. I mean, uh, being a storm chaser in 1999 without all the knickknacks and do-rags and all those cool things you can have now right on your phone. It must have been really hard to do this in late 90s, I think. 
They are trained to recognize conditions which could cause a tornado. That morning, Lon notices a severe weather front moving into the area. Ideal tornado weather. Around 11.30, 11.45 in the morning, I looked to the north and I could see a towering uh, cloud, a big thunderhead that appeared to be developing. Uh, that, had, that had literally just mushroomed up in no time at all. And I realized that if we had storms develop later in the day, they would be very intense. Lon Curtis's prediction is correct. In the skies above central Texas that morning, a massive storm is developing. It could well bring tornadoes in its wake. Unknown to the residents of Gerald, the storm front lies just 30 miles north of their town. They continue to enjoy the warm, sunny weather. The clear blue sky gives no indication of what is to come. At 1.15, the weather service issues a tornado watch. This is a warning to be on the lookout in a specific area. As it's the height of the storm season, listeners still aren't too concerned. Many such watches are issued at this time of year, and they frequently come to nothing. Oh. Lon Curtis continues to drive through so the that's, I, that's that's completely understandable. You hear a tornado warning like 14 times a day, and 13 of them are nothing. And the last one is completely devastating. So you're supposed to take all the warnings on a serious note. But I understand it's going to be kind of tedious to run down the storm shelter every time you hear uh, a warning. Watching, waiting. It doesn't take long. Uh, I turned northeast from Moody and drove three, four, five miles up and downhill, uh, some winding roads, came around to bend, and uh, there was a tornado. Oh, so the tornado warnings got to be Lon immediately less... contacts the weather service. Hi. Lon... Their fears are confirmed. Twister just touched down. I'm north of Salado. Oh, no. Look at that. TV programs oh. are interrupted, and news bulletins begin broadcasting the first Waco. tornado warning of the day. Right now. Coming out of Hewitt. More will follow. Right there. Moving out towards Interstate 35, so from Hewitt to... The weatherman makes no mention of Gerald. It does not at present appear to be in the tornado's path. Is the, path of this storm. the storm is heading in a southeasterly direction. At this point, there appears to be no cause for concern for the people of Gerald. Their town lies to the southwest. Lon Curtis follows the storm. Suddenly, four more tornadoes appear, sweeping across the farmland. At the Weather Services office in Austin, meteorologists use radar to track the storm. Suddenly, it changes direction. Oh. It's now heading straight for Gerald. Let's go back to our other radar scan. This is a live picture of the thunderstorm in view, currently affecting areas from Troy back down toward Temple and Belton, heading down I-35 toward Holland and Salado, and then into northern Williamson County near the Gerald area. Back Lon Curtis begins to move south, driving in front of the storm. At 2.45, In front. he sees his seventh tornado of the day. I've been Seven. observing the small, thin tornado, the one that's shaped really, describing it as being like a pencil is fairly accurate. Uh, near Prairie Dell, that's four and a half miles from Gerald. And that tornado had been almost stationary. The tornado began to move uh, about 3.20 in the afternoon. It began to move toward the south. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I got goosebumps on that. I went down the interstate highway about halfway to Gerald, two miles or so. And that necessitated turning my back on the tornado. Uh, 
I don't like those. They give me the creeps. It had changed. It was no longer a small pencil-shaped tornado. It was what we call a multi-vortex tornado, which is a series of small tornadoes or vortices rotating around a central point. So now we're gonna find out the the dead man walking. See if we can, see if I can actually see this. When I saw that it almost stopped my heart because a small thin tornado is dangerous enough but a multi-vortex tornado can be very destructive hi bell county fire department we need to get a message down to williamson county it changed the whole complexion of the afternoon if you will because i thought the town of gerald was squarely in the path of this developing large tornado it's on the ground. Lon's fears are confirmed. South, this is no north. ordinary tornado. For the people of Gerald, time has started to run out. At 3.30 p.m., the Weather Service issues another tornado warning. The National Weather Service in Austin, San Antonio, has issued a tornado warning effective until 4.30 p.m. for people in Williamson County in South Central Texas. Tornadic thunderstorm was located about five miles west of Gerald. Wow, it's so at 10 freaking miles an huge! Hour. This storm has had a history of producing tornadoes and large hail. The city of Gerald is in the path of this storm. Blake, Blake, that was mom on the phone. We gotta go to. Mrs. Bukowski hears the warning and phones home to tell her children. Doesn't look like tornado weather to me. She tells Amy and Blake to go to her mother's house. Her mother's house is built of brick. It is still a clear sunny day yeah this is something i would probably understand that look up and there's clear skies not a single cloud warm weather calmness there's a slight breeze and you're being told that you gotta take shelter because there's a tornado coming i get that i get that remember if you're caught outside seek shelter in a nearby reinforced building as a last resort, seek shelter in a ditch or a low spot and cover your head. People in or near the path of this storm should take immediate action to protect their lives. Bueno? At the Hernandez household, Maria is alone with her children. Gabriel is at work. The Hernandez's TV set is broken, and Maria is oblivious to the approaching danger. Fortunately for her and her family, a friend calls to make sure she's heard the news. Do not stay in mobile homes or vehicles. Get into a sturdy building. Repeating, that's a tornado warning for people in Williamson County until 4.30 p.m. Moving almost due south. For persons in Troy... Debbie Chris, LaFrance is alerted by a local news bulletin. If you're in a mobile home, get out. Find a safe place. If you don't find a safe place, the tornado is right at your house. The best thing to do is go ahead and find a ditch and lie flat in She the tells ditch. Kristen to go and wake her father. Look at the debris circling around this tornado. Look at it. At 3.35, oh, yeah. the go. General Fire Department's emergency siren sounds, warning people to take cover. Blake and Amy start to run towards their grandmother's house. The tornado is now only one and a half miles away. Oh, wow. It starts to churn its way across the fields towards the Double Creek suburb. At the Hernandez house, Maria and her children, together with her next-door neighbors, go down into the storm shelter under the kitchen floor. Maria's husband, Gabriel, is at work, unaware of the danger his family is in. What the hell? <clears throat> Amy and Blake reach their grandmother's house, which is empty. She is out of town. Along with some neighbors, they shelter inside in a windowless closet. The tornado strikes Double Creek.
As the noise grows louder, Dabila France looks outside. There, in front of her, is the tornado. Oh, that looked like a, oh my God. That's the biggest the one I've seen. Native American legend speaks of the dead man walking. If you like... see him in a tornado, you are about to die. Oh, wow. The townsfolk of Gerald can now see the arms and legs. Oh. Oh, I got the weird. Oh, my God. I got... Oh, my Lord. I got some goosebumps in my arm. Oh, uh, that is the nastiest picture I have seen. This is the dead man walking. Look at that. Of a multi vortex tornado approaching. Wow. The dead man has just walked into Gerald. It's mad, mad. Uh, let's see if we can skip the. Maybe. Emerging turns. Arm shelter the tornado. And takes refuge from our area. Check out what's <coughs> coming up this month on timeout and be on the Oh, line 90s commercials, guys. Does it bring you back for a bit? Your thoughts and opinions on local Lehigh clock only. The La France family follows the advice given in the tornado warnings and takes refuge in the bathroom. It's an interior room with no windows, and the plumbing anchors the bath to the ground, making it the safest place in the house. Billy gives Debbie and Kristen pillows and quilts to protect them from flying debris and glass. Okay, don't you worry. It's just a little breeze, that's all. Get out of here! That's the bath isn't big enough for all three of them, so Billy kneels beside it and holds on tight. Oh my god, it's just, no oh my shit's gonna hit the fan now. Oh They can only hope that this will be enough to save them from the tornado's incredible power. The Hernandez storm shelter, the tornado is now directly overhead. Blake and Amy Bukowski are joined by their dad, Keith. He is convinced the house will not withstand its enormous power. Defying all advice on tornado survival, he decides there and then that he and his family must try to outrun it in the car. But you can't. You can't outrun it. We're talking about 300 miles per hour. He ain't forgot his keys. James Lynch and Mike Price saw for themselves they couldn't believe their <coughs> eyes when they saw this tornado in Gerald. Tornado's progress is unusually slow. What? It lingers for what seems like hours over Double Creek.
want to be outside cloud watching in weather like this. You don't want to be on the telephone. You want to be making sure that you've got yourself protected. At the LaFrances, Billy clings desperately to the bath. If he lets go now, he will be sucked into the vortex. Oh my god, this actually did happen. It just... Uh... So I know it's a reenactment, and uh, I am just thinking that this has to be a reenactment of actual actual families that this happened to. Underground, the Hernandez family prays that Gabrielle's shelter can withstand the enormous twister swirling above their heads. It's a lingering twister, taking its time. Bukowskis appear to be heading into danger. The only route to the highway means driving back into the path of the oncoming tornado. Oh, no! No! It looks like Keith has made a terrible mistake. Just getting some additional information in. Thank you, Stacy, about that uh, tornado that, that came in. I'm talking to some uh, tornado spotters uh, that are uh, friends of mine in Oklahoma City. And now this video that we have shot this afternoon, uh, Stacy, has been uh, is playing all around the country. This is becoming a very large uh, news story, and the videotape that I told you a few minutes ago looks to me to be F3, F4 at least. Uh, he tells me that uh, this storm to him looks a whole lot like one was rated F5. Oh my god, you're gonna hold on. Tomorrow the storm hits. It's home the magic It's the small town. The tornado has yours burn up the atmosphere. Oh! Oh, the atmosphere. By 555, the tornado has finally passed through Gerald. But the huge storm which spawned it continues to rage. Lon Curtis follows the storm as it continues south. It produces one more tornado that afternoon, which hits the small town of Cedar Park. But the damage is on a minor scale compared to what has happened to Gerald. But we do know that this tornado has caused untold damage in Gerald now. The Associated Press reporting, as Stacy reported to you a few minutes ago, that the, the damage is incredible and that uh, the city has been, I believe Stacy's words were, leveled. I was, I was about to say leveled. No. Oh my god, it's gonna be hard to watch. It's gonna be hard to watch. There's nothing left, is it? Completely annihilated, completely leveled out. Keith Bukowski has driven around in a wide circle, desperately trying to outrun the storm. Now he drops back behind it and returns to the house. Against all odds, he has outrun the tornado. Wow. It just looked like uh, the place exploded. And of course, everybody was just kind of felt, you know, in shock for a minute there.
Well, the closet was torn to pieces. The roof above the closet was gone. Everything inside the closet was sucked out of the roof. Uh, the walls that enclosed the closet were gone. More than likely, they would have been sucked right out of the house. The La Francis house has been flattened by the tornado. Debbie and Kristen have survived, but not Billy. His remains are discovered the following day, 300 yards from their home. I guess the wind blew us out of the house. There was a peach tree beside the house, and I ended up in that tree, and Kristen was on the ground, and I think if that tree hadn't been there, we probably would have both been killed because I think that tree stopped us and didn't let us be blown any farther. And I believe oh. that's what saved us. So they all of them got sucked out of the house. The husband got flown 300 yards and killed. And these other poor people got thrown into a tree and got stuck at the tree. <sighs> the emergency services found the Hernandez family and their neighbors still sheltering in Gabriel's oh. storm bunker. Of the house they had once lived in, there was nothing left. But to Gabriel's relief, his family had survived. Well, when I found my wife and my babies, they was real wet and muddy. Kind of like scared, you know, like shaking a little bit, but they didn't know what to do. They was without words, and I was shot myself too. I didn't know what to do, to hug them or kiss them or, you know, it's just something you can explain what, what to, what to, you know, what to do, what to say. The Hernandez family is with us today. Their home, car, belongings, all gone. The children now play on the concrete slab where their kitchen once stood. A few feet over, a hole in the ground. This hole saved the Hernandez family's life. It's a storm shelter Gabriel and his wife Maria Isabel dug with their own hands after losing their home in the 1989 tornado. The path of the tornado went through the Hernandez home. Now, on this side of his house, five people were killed. The tornado went through this way, over their shelter, and across the street, killing three people in that home as well. 27 people died in Gerald that day. Whole families perished together. Whole families. The following day, the survivors of Gerald struggled to come to terms with the extent of the tragedy. As the search went on for the bodies of the missing, scientists arrived to study the scenes of devastation and assess the damage. Examining the immediate aftermath of a tornado remains one of the most effective ways of gathering information on how they function. The only real indicator of the power of a tornado and its reading on the Frigita scale is the wreckage it leaves behind. I uh, visited the uh, community at daybreak the next morning. And it wasn't until I actually walked the ground shortly after 9 o'clock in the morning that it became apparent that what had happened to Gerald was an F5. And the signs were quite evident. The countryside, the ground was literally shaved. No grass, no trees, everything shaved to the uh, ground. The asphalt was sucked up, literally gone. It takes a lot of force to be able to suck up asphalt. The full ex All right, we are halfway-ish. If you still hear, Please use, if you're a member, please use the still here emoji. If you're not, just say, Recky, I'm with you. Let's continue. The extent of the damage could be seen from the air. Professor Don Green of Baylor University surveyed the trail of devastation left by the tornado in its wake. 
At the touchdown of the Gerald Tornado, it ripped up the ground. We had a cotton field at the touchdown point in which the cotton plant was not only pulled out of the ground, the soil itself was removed down to a depth of about 18 inches. Next, it swept across a, a wheat field. All of those shafts were then plucked out of the ground, flying through the air by the millions, and then impaling these cows that were in the field beyond that. This herd was vaulted into the air, picked up, whirled around, bounced along the ground many times so that the animals had broken legs. In terms of uh, the, the exposure to the wind itself, often the uh, cattle lost their, their hair. They were skinned. Often what you would see is something like uh, meat in a butcher shop. In some cases, what you saw was mostly skeleton. I think one of the most impressive uh, images that I saw occurred at one of the early houses where it was only at an F2 strength. In this particular case, you were looking at a storm shelter in which a monolithic concrete slab weighing well over a ton, four to five in inches of concrete, was lifted off of the ground. I looked for the, the top of the storm shelter. I asked the owner where it is. He said he could not find it. I went back a week later and asked again, did you ever find the top to your storm shelter? Apparently, it, it caught into the wind and flew off like a frisbee, never to be found again. From there, I could then see how it was gaining in strength, such that by the time it reached Gerald, it was at its greatest strength, its greatest breadth on the ground, almost a half mile wide. And at that point, everything was removed from the ground. It was clear that the Gerald tornado, as it came to be known, was even by Texas standards, unimaginable. Light objects were blown huge distances. A box of checks was later recovered a hundred miles away. Oh. Other heavier objects, refrigerators, oh. air conditioners, kitchen sinks, were completely destroyed. They were lifted into the vortex of the tornado and reduced to shrapnel in the swirling column of debris. The effect of such force on a human body is best left to the imagination. Yeah, I'm not going to think about killed, it had to be identified from their dental records. Part of the problem with the Gerald Tornado was its slow forward velocity across the Double Creek Estates. Normally, we think of tornadoes perhaps raking across the ground 60 miles an hour. In this case, it was only moving forward at, at a rate of about one to two miles per hour for about 10 to 15 minutes. And so all of that debris, the wheat, the mud, uh, the, the shrapnel from cars, the debris from homes simply churning in place minute after minute without uh, reprieve. And for that reason, the Double Creek Estates was simply <clears throat> wiped off the map. Amazingly. I can't, I, I'm trying to imagine the sheer power pulling up anything. There's no limit to what this tornado picked up. Say it, name it. Yeah, it did. Asphalt. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to talk about the cows because it actually hurts me more than you can probably imagine. Poor cows, poor people, poor everything. Same tornado which was capable of That's reducing a brutal the car to a pile of scrap metal left delicate objects completely unscathed. Yeah, I found a lot of glass things that weren't broken. I found a cake dish that my uh, sister-in-law had given me. It was all solid glass, and it didn't have a scratch on it. And it's, you know, it's not a small thing. And some coffee cups and some other little figurines, you know. It I'm very well of the Zoomies behind me. It just amazes me that anything glass could survive, but we found several glass things. We found, it wasn't ours, but we found <clears throat> a bottle of champagne in our yard. <laughs> 24 hours after the tornado had struck, power lines were back up. Within a week, homes were being rebuilt. This wasn't the first time the people of Gerald had been forced to restart their lives. Now. Now we see one thing I love is that how communities and how people come together and just help each other out to get everything back. I love that. This is <clears throat> what humanity is all about. The best we can tell, 
Uh, Gerald has been hit eight times in recorded oh. history. One eight. family that I talked to had been there long enough to live through three of those, and, and um, they just said they weren't coming back. In spite of what they'd been through, almost all of Gerald's residents decided to stay there. But the question many of them were asking was, could it happen again? Okay, we got some commercials here. See if I can skip those. Moving forward. Check out three episodes of UFOs Uncovered. Find anywhere else. Being shipped by order now. This Holy crap, that's a long commercial break. Oh, Seventh, nineteen ninety. The weather conditions on May 27, 1997, were ideal for the formation of tornadoes. The Gerald tornado was created by a sequence of meteorological events which spawned most twisters in Tornado Alley. As the sun warmed the Earth's surface, some areas had started to heat up more rapidly than others. This created a pocket of air which rose through the atmosphere, gathering energy as it went. As the warm air continued to rise, cold air rushed in to replace it. It in turn was warmed by the Earth's surface and began to rise upwards. Soon there was a continuous current of air rising into the atmosphere. As long as the air above was colder, the column moved ever higher. This is how a thunderhead is formed. Most thunderstorms are weak and short-lived, but occasionally the rising air travels so fast, reaching wind speeds of up to 175 miles per hour, that a supercell is produced. A supercell is a thunderstorm that is of gigantic proportions. Usually a supercell can grow in size such that it spans several counties in length. We're talking about something that might stretch 50 or 60 miles across where normally we think of a thunderstorm that might be five to 10 miles in diameter. This supercell thunderstorm yeah. is capable of producing tornadoes, and scientists have identified many of the elements which need to be in place for it to do so. One of the things that uh, scientists look for are the convergence of winds from different directions as you go vertically up. That is typically here in the plains, warm moist air coming off of the Gulf of Mexico. It's meeting dry, warm air from Mexico. And then out of the north, we have the continental polar, the cold air masses, all converging together. And when those three air masses meet, this is the thing that will give the spinning motion to cause the thunderstorm to produce the tornado. The tornado usually forms at the storm's middle section. It is thought that the cold air rushing towards the Earth's surface at the rear of the storm then takes the tornado down with it, concentrating the storm's entire energy on a single point on the ground. In terms of amount of energy that could be released, if you could release all of that energy in an instant, they say it would be roughly equal to five hydrogen bombs. With the potential to release such devastating power, it is important for meteorologists to try to predict when and where tornadoes might happen. <clears throat> and I guess they're pretty good at it now. Right? Scientists use Doppler radar to locate the thunderstorms with Doppler. rotating air currents. As a storm moves away from the radar location, it starts to turn red on the radar screen. As it moves towards the radar location, it turns green. If both colors are present, it suggests there is a rotating movement in that area of the storm. This is the Ooh. point where tornadoes are most likely to occur. Now wow. the weather service will begin a tornado watch. A watch can cover an area of up to 40,000 square miles and can last for up to six hours. This is a frequent occurrence at the height of the tornado season and does not necessarily mean that a tornado will actually occur. Only half of all rotating thunderstorms produce tornadoes. Scientists are still trying to discover why this is. It might start some of the houses on the southeast side of Dover. Even with some of the most sensitive forecasting technology in the world at their disposal, the weather services in Tornado Alley still rely on a network of amateur storm spotters trained to give what they call ground truth. We can't, we hear it even. This 
this thing is half, less than half a mile from us. Uh, yes, Gary, we're about uh, 10 miles east of Byron. Uh, the tornado was still on the ground. These it's people doing this. Oh, I'm imagining that there was uh, storm chasers back then was the essence of actually pointing out exactly where uh, where the tornado hit. Together with today, with the amazing instruments that they have, and together with storm spotters, I really hope that the advancement in technology has made it so much easier to spot when and where and especially what direction you guys gotta help me it's out it's on the ground about a half a mile in the field this debris is flying everywhere radar can give us good clues that things are happening and can help a forecaster uh, know what part of the storm to pay attention to and actually ask spotters for information about a particular thing but the actual confirmation that a tornado is occurring or is about to occur typically has to come from a trained human being actually looking at the storm we found no technology that can actually replace the uh, an intelligent human being watching what's going on. Okay. I understand that. Okay, watch out through these power lines. I understand that. Power lines out. It's crossing. It's crossing Highway 33 right now. Oh my God! It just hit, hit a house. It just hit a house. Oh my God! Oh my God! Armed with on-the-ground confirmation from the storm spotters, the weather service can then issue a tornado warning. A tornado warning targets an area smaller than a county, naming the town or towns that are likely to be hit. Bulletin, this is a tornado warning. The National Weather As tornado warnings are specific to such a small area, the Weather Service has never been able to give much in the way of advance warning, but the situation is improving. We have made great strides in the Weather Service in the last uh, few years, especially with the Doppler radar. In the, the old days, prior to 1994, for example, most of our warnings were after the fact. Uh, by the way, you were hit by a tornado, and sorry about that. Now, the national average is nine minutes lead time. Oh. So in nine minutes, minutes, a lot of people, and most people, should be able to do something about themselves, you know, as to where to, where to go and what to do to protect yourself. Nine Normally minutes. Normally, the best thing to do is to get to a purpose-built storm shelter, but shelters are rare in Texas, despite the high number of tornadoes. <clears throat> Uh, I, uh, I don't think that's the case now, is it? If you live in Texas, is storm shelters more normal now than it was in the late 90s, evidently? First of all, the water table is too close to the ground. You start digging, in no time at all you get water. Mother Nature bedrock is not too far away from the ground either. Uh, so it takes a heap of digging, dynamite sometimes, just to build a, uh, dig a hole. And therefore, it becomes an economic offset. Do I spend another four or five thousand dollars or more to dig a shelter, or have a bona fide shelter, or do I take uh, my chances mm. and save four or five thousand dollars and hopefully I'll not get hit? Well, the majority, like 99.9 percent .9 of the population in this area, will take their chances and not get hit. Ah, uh, yeah, I understand. Without an underground Money shelter thing. to take refuge in, the choice is to run or stay put. The decision the residents of Gerald made that day largely determined whether they lived or died. Keith Bukowski decided to get his family in their car and outrun the tornado. This is usually a dangerous course of action. Tornadoes move unpredictably and can change course in an instant. Yeah, they were lucky. Inside of a car is the last place that you really want to be. A tornado will very easily pick up a car and toss it about. Um, what I like to liken it to is take a, a Coke can, uh, drop a marble in it, shake it, and that's you bouncing around inside that vehicle. Some people caught on the road took shelter in a nearby underpass. This is also extremely dangerous, as it offers no protection from the lethal cast. This is uh, probably the worst place, right? Whirling debris. Many followed the official advice. They stayed at home and sheltered in the bathtub covering themselves with pillows and cushions as protection against falling debris. Tragically, the Gerald tornado was moving so slowly and with such power that following the official advice was probably the most dangerous course of action to take. The advice that we give people to head for inside protection, a small room well within their house, away from windows, that's still good advice. In the case of Gerald, however, we're looking at an F5 tornado. 
the odds of it occurring are less than two one hundredths of one percent. We only oh. have, on average, one every year. And so what you have to do is hope and pray that the tornado that's bearing down on you is not an F5. If it is an F5, then the advice that's given to you probably will not save your life. It was an amazing afternoon for me. It, that many tornadoes, all of them within 25 miles of my home, uh, makes it a, a, an afternoon that I will never forget. Uh, but it's also uh, a bittersweet sort of uh, recollection because uh, I would give all of that back uh, to have the lives restored that were taken by that tornado. Yeah. Human com comedy, wet to LC 300 foot storm, 200 zing, rippy to it. Yes, yes, might be uh... okay. Of the 27 people who died in Gerald that day, 14 were children. Blake and Amy both took it pretty bad. Perhaps Blake maybe a little bit more because of uh, two of the boys that were, were killed. Were, he just went out to the lake the day before with them. They had to grow up fast. They had to face it. They didn't have a choice. It was just thrown in their lap. As time has passed, it's gotten a little easier. But at first, it was real tough. It was real tough on all the kids up there at that school. Some people in Gerald moved away after the tornado. But Debbie LaFrance moved back to Double Creek, where her house has been rebuilt. I decided to go ahead and stay here. <clears throat> I mean, this is home. To me, this is home now. And you can't run away from a tornado. Wherever you go, they can find you. You can't, that's not something you can be afraid of. The underground storm shelter, which Gabriel Hernandez had carved out of the rock, saved the lives of three of his neighbors, as well as his wife and children. I'm proud of what my wife did. Because if it wasn't for that, you know, I probably didn't have no family no more. Yeah. yeah she was real. I mean, I'm going to say, <clears throat> I guess God, you know, put something in her to, to bring them in in time because it was close. We were real happy to be alive. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. We were real happy to be alive. We can replace the house. You can lose everything if you got your family. I mean, that's a, the best thing you can have. F5 tornadoes are rare events. On average, there is only one per year in Tornado Alley. But the inhabitants of Gerald now live in constant readiness. They know a tornado can strike at any time, and that once again, they will see the dead man walking. Okay, Gerald. Gerald, uh, this was probably the worst video I've seen when it comes to a uh, tornado. Um, I don't know what to say. This is actually one of those videos that actually enforce the fact that a tornado can be unimaginable powerful picking up asphalt and skinning cows I can't, it's just hard to get hard to understand i'm gonna wrap it up here we're getting close to an hour if you're still here um edit your uh previous comment and say till the end recky if you did enjoy this don't forget to smack the like and of course hit that subscribe i would greatly appreciate that 
And thank you so much for watching. I'm Ricky. You stay safe.